internet friends. Welcome to another episode of the Synergy Cafe online show featuring speaker, entertainer, close-up illusionist, and marketing alchemist, Magic Brad. It's the internet lifestyle show about career, finance, relationships, spirituality, and wellness. We're moving the online chatter over to real life activity. And now, please welcome your host of Synergy Cafe, Magic Brad. Hey, Internet friends, this is Magic Brad with Synergy Cafe. Turn up your sound so you can hear what's going to be happening here. This is Magic Brad again with Synergy Cafe, and I've got another guest on, but he's been here before, and he's back again. His name is Gleb. You there, Gleb? Yes, I am. How do, you say, how do you say your last name again? Sipurski. So, Sipurski. Sipurski, with the little Perfect. roll. Sipurski. <laughs> I'm learning, I'm learning. There so, now, are you up in Canada? No, I'm in Columbus, which is Columbus, Ohio, so not too far from Canada, just okay. uh, you know, just well, south of Canada. Well, I'm in Minnesota, but I do a lot of these interviews, and sometimes I get confused to where where people came from and stuff because mm -hmm. I hit people all over the all over the world here. So we did an earlier one about what you do, and if I remember correctly, you help businesses with like um, like uh, making decisions and things like that in in the corporate workplace. Yes. I help everyone with making decisions. So making wise decisions in the business, in politics, in relationships, in daily life. And today you and I decided to focus on my work in businesses as a disaster avoidance expert. Yeah, I, my wife did some coaching with a woman and she used to say that a confused mind does not buy. So even in the sales arena, I think it's helpful if a person can make a decision because then they know what direction they're taking. I mean, we've probably all done this before where you're going along and you're wondering, should I take a left or a right? And then you don't do either and you get a disaster, yes. right? <laughs> yes, and then you just crash into the stop sign in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> so how does a person know which to choose? When some things balance out the same way, how do you know what to choose? So that's an important uh, reason why people bring me in. Um, as a disaster avoidance expert is at the stage of making important decisions kind of when they want to launch a new project when they're figuring out who to collaborate with uh, whether to have start a new policy and i research this stuff so I'm a professor at ohio state researching decision making and emotional and social intelligence and i also run a nonprofit that promotes popularizes research in decision-making and emotional intelligence to a broad audience at intentionalinsights.org. And I'm a consultant, so people bring me in for this stuff. So what I talk about is that we need to not combine both our intuitions and our reason in order to make wise decisions. So here's how I would approach a business that let's say they are deciding who to collaborate with. And who to collaborate with, they have a number of options. Let's say they have um, a large multinational company who they can potentially collaborate with, or one, a smaller one, their hometown, or like a you know one that's as uh, a national one within their country, and they don't know who they want to choose. So what they would want to do at that stage, I mean, most folks would just kind of you know look at the price and so on, but that's not the only factor that you want to look at. Mm -hmm. The way to actually make a wise decision is to look at all the categories of importance. So price would be only one of them. Then the other one is, let's say, convenience. How easy is it to get a hold of the people who you want to collaborate with, uh, your contractor? How important is that for you? How important is reliability? So reliability is another one. How important is experience in the business? How long, you know, the small person in your hometown might not be very experienced, and how important is that for you? That's for you to decide. And a whole bunch of other factors that are important for you to decide. So you choose a, a variety of factors, and then you give weight to those factors. So let's say on a scale of 1 to 10. So price might be something like, let's say you're somewhat price conscious, so you give it a weight of 7. And let's say you really want a long-term collaboration with whoever you choose. So that's really important for you. You give that a ranking of 9 and so on. So you give a weight to your rankings. So you rank the various categories that are important for you, give them weights, and then you rank each person 
each collaborator on that ranking. So let's say, you know, you have collaborator A, B, and C, and collaborator A might be a ranking of five on price, you know, middle price. Somebody else might be a ranking of eight because they're much cheaper and so on. And so then you multiply the rankings by the weights to make the decision. And that gives you a very kind of clear decision-making process where you separate you, the important aspects of the decision, the categories by which you make a decision, by how good each value is, each option is on that decision-making matrix. So then you go through it and you figure out, okay, like this is the, whoever gets the highest score, that's your first pass at making the decision. After that, you have to consult your emotions. How do you feel about that score? Is that, does it, is that really congruent with your emotions, with your feelings, with your gut intuitions? And then you play around with the numbers based on whether it's congruent with your feelings or not. Because the first part of that taps, taps into your reasoning, into your logic. The second part taps into your feelings, into your emotions, your gut instincts. So then I go with my clients through how they feel about it, why they might feel, why they might have hesitations in their guts, guts around various numbers. And then we go and we change the numbers in each one. And then we go through a variety of thinking errors that people tend to fall into. So for example, let's say that the choice in your hometown is a friend of yours. And that might be something that would lead you to bias, to be biased toward that friend of yours, yeah. but that might not be good for business. So then you need to think about, well, what aspects of favorability rankings am I giving that friend that's not really conducive to making a good business decision? business decision. And then you want to think about those sorts of things, you know, so all of the things that might bias you so that you can come out in the end with a decision that's most in line with your values and goals. Because sometimes if you're a small businessman um, or a businesswoman, it might be conducive to your values to go with your friend just because, you know, she or he is your friend and it's more important to you to have a good friendship than make money. And that's fine, but that's something you need to be comfortable with in your feelings and your emotions and know that that's why you're making the decision. That's kind of a decision-making process that responds to the question that you asked. If you have a number of decisions with unknown variables, how do you go through that and how do you make the decision? So that's a, a good reason for someone to hire someone like you that's an outsider because if it's internal, sometimes like uh, coworkers and things may kind of you know, you really should hire Betty because she you've known her. For, that might not be the right decision, right? So you kind of give them the tools that they can kind of really logically weigh this out and give them that ranking system and stuff. And I'm assuming that every decision is kind of ch going to change a little bit because maybe it's, uh, you know, there might be different reasons. Uh, it might be a personal relationship or it might be because I'm a member of, this, of the community for so long. And those, all those things are going to waver, right? Absolutely. And it's not necessarily a bad thing to hire Betty, but it's a bad thing to hire Betty um, just because of guilt or shame or yeah. something like that. You might say, you might decide that, well, you know, I've known Betty for a long time and I trust her. I don't know these other people. I don't have this trust relationship with them. So Betty might not be as competent as they are, but I trust Betty and she's more reliable in my eyes. But that's something important for you to be able to admit honestly to yourself and not kind of have, oh, I'm hiring Betty because I would feel guilty if I didn't and it would you know, har harm my relationship with Betty. So just having the, this honesty with yourself is really important. And that's a reason, another important reason why it's really hard to have that honesty with yourself if you are, if you don't have an external person yeah. kind of calling you out on your BS sometimes. Uh, <laughs> And uh, it's very easy to lie to ourselves. It's there, one of the easiest things to do. There, there's to lie that. To it's nice to have a, an outside person come in and bring and kind of, like you said, hold them to your hold you to the hold your feet to the flames, so to speak. But the other thing I was thinking about is they have said that people that are successful are people who can make decisions fast. And to me, the internet has made the, the whole concept of that 
you can get stuff out in real time. It's happening real fast. Everything's moving so fast these days. Making a decision fast is is very very important. I mean, it's not like you you've got this big cruise ship and you slowly make the turn anymore. You got to be able to pivot and make those decisions quickly. So that's uh, another factor, isn't it? It depends on the decision, Brad. So people sometimes feel that they have to make decisions quickly and more quickly than they actually have to. So for example, when you're releasing a new product, let's say, and that's a, you know a, a, often the reason that people bring me in, let's say they want to decide whether to release a new product or not. A lot of people, you know, that's not a decision you need to make quickly. <laughs> That's a decision you want to kind of take your time and decide and test the market and see if there's a good reason to do it. I remember a company that was really eager about bringing out a new product that their software engineers created this uh, brand spanking new product and they were really wanted to bring it out. The engineers said the marketing and sales department were hesitant. So I worked with the marketing and sales department and the engineers who created the product. And, you know, we tested the marketplace and we saw that, you know, there is really not as much demand for the product as the engineers would have liked to believe there was demand for the product. And we evaluated the, the costs of bringing out the product, including, including something that people really don't think about nearly enough, which is called opportunity cost. Mm -hmm. And the opportunity cost is a decision-making principle, kind of research-based decision-making principle, where the opportunity of the time and effort you put into making a launch of something, you're not putting that time and effort into something else. So that's the cost of opportunity. And so we evaluated that product, and we saw that really the opportunity cost of it would be too high. And despite the product being prepared and you know, ready to launch, the company didn't decide, decided not to go through with it after evaluating the kind of costs that would come with launching that product okay. because they could be working on something else that would, you know, be better. And they eventually ended up, you know, going back to drawing board and not going, not being engineer led, but being market led, kind of looking at what the customers wanted and telling the engineers, no, this is not what you should be working on work on this different thing that the customers actually want, and then that thing succeeded. Got it. If they went with a product that customers didn't really want and they tried to push it to customers, it would have been a disaster. So that's kind of you know where they brought me in and helped avoid that disaster. So that's a decision that is hard to make for a company internally when they are when they have a product ready to go and and, but that doesn't take time. That's That takes time to evaluate and think about. That's not a snap decision that yeah. you have to make. Sometimes so, not making a decision or making a decision to not go forward is the best decision. It's yeah. the wisest decision. I was, I was just thinking that uh, not making a decision is a decision. Absolutely. Just kind not, of, make, not going forward is very much a decision. And it's a wise decision. So my, I have a friend, Ron Eccles, he used to talk about the four Ds of do, delay, delete, and delegate. And so that uh -huh. sometimes you got to delay things and put it off. But it, and then he also uses this thing. Are you familiar with this? Like this, this grid, uh, this quadrant of uh, important and urgent. Yes, important that, and not urgent. Yes. Yep. Yeah, because I'm it's, quite, quite familiar with that. It's very tempting for people to do things that are urgent and not important. And that's yeah, that's another thing that we talk about. So uh, getting back to the uh, other question or another aspect of the question you asked, a lot of decisions feel urgent. So going to the quadrant, but they're not nearly as urgent as they feel. And sometimes right. they're not nearly as important as they are urgent. It's fundamentally, it's really important to figure out what's in the important and urgent category, and then what's in the important and not urgent category. And do those things first rather than things that are urgent, but not important. <laughs> Got it. So I'm just kind of curious, is there any kind of any client that you've had that uh, like didn't take your advice and something chaotic may have happened? Something that uh, <laughs> they went the other direction and yes, uh, there was a client who worked. We I worked with a client about performance man around performance management. So the client had um, a performance management system where they had a number of engineers 
it's I think they had something like 150 engineers and they were billed by uh, the hour. So the clients, so engineers, as you can imagine, are really oriented toward problem solving. Yeah. That's kind of like what they love to do. And this client had the problem, uh, the client, the company, had the problem that they weren't getting enough sales. They weren't making enough sales because the engineers weren't very good at marketing or customer service. Mm -hmm. So marketing is something that the engineers can do through engaging in things like thought leadership pieces, going to conferences and talking about their skills, writing white papers, writing blog pieces, you know, and so on. So that's kind of the th kind of thing that engineers can do in marketing, but they're not excited about it. That's not like fun for them. Not right. nearly as fun as problem solving. Then uh, customer service, they can co call customers, they can work with customers, they can provide, answer customers' questions, but that's not nearly as fun and exciting for them as working on underlying engineering kind of problems. And this was kind of, uh, just to be clear, this wasn't software engineering. This was welding, kind of technical, uh, you know, metallurgy stuff, engineering, like real deep engineering. So I suggested to that client that they need to change their performance management system because they were, the engineers were built by the hour. So whether they spend that time talking to clients or doing marketing or you know, solving their engineering problems, they were built the same way. And they said, well, look, this is just not going to work. It's not incentivizing people in the right way. So this is about social and emotional intelligence. It's not incentivizing people to do what you want them to do. So you need to change the incentives for them to be emotionally engaged with actually client service and with marketing, so various forms of marketing. I told them that it would be really wise for them to have systems that give engineers various forms of bonus points and give them social incentives for orienting toward marketing and customer service. So things like praising engineers publicly for doing these things, mm -hmm. creating team and peer evaluations of engineers where other engineers evaluate them on their skills in customer service and in marketing. Because at heart, what engineers care about is reputation among their peers, what their peers think about them, what people around them think about them. And right. if their peers have positive reinforcement, provide them with positive reinforcement for doing customer service and marketing, that's what the engineers will do. Ah. Well, so within that company, the HR department was strongly supportive of my advice, but um, the people at the top weren't really, they are engineers themselves kind of, so they came from bottom up and they didn't really, they weren't enthusiastic about the idea of reforming the performance management system. And so that company kept going with their current performance management system. And it was quite unfortunate because it's the sales kept deteriorating. You know, last time I checked their sales were going down and down and the engineers were basically like, they had nothing to do. They didn't have problems to solve. See, I can, I can see that because I've worked in a very similar situation where someone is very, very logical and they look at the, uh, the tracking and stuff through the internet analytics and all this. And like they're trying to get longer video views. And their method of getting longer video views is by, by tracking stuff and moving things from here to there. Where I'm thinking maybe you got to do something more interesting in the video more emotional and fun and exciting and it'll be a longer video view where an engineer wouldn't think that they think how can I make these numbers work better by multiplication and but if you put more color and flavor into it maybe you'd get longer video views so I can I can totally resonate with that <laughs> yeah absolutely so you need to create the right incentives for people to watch the video like you're saying because so that the video would be more fun right <laughs> not so that uh, you know Right, so what yeah. you're saying is the engineers were more interested in problem solving, so if they're going to be in customer service, they probably should be in something like troubleshooting of solving the problem that the customer had, and they'd probably be excited to talk about that. But again, right. they don't want to necessarily talk about their the 
customer because uh, that's not about engineering stuff. They want to talk to their colleagues and talk about fixing things. Yes, I get it. So you need to create incentives for them. Engineers they need to look at what the engineers are motivated by, and kind of they are strongly motivated by reputation among their colleagues. So what people around them think are good things to do. So you need to change the culture of what people around them think are good things to do by incentivizing them to, so I was talking about, let's say, creating teams of engineers that are going to hold each other accountable yeah. for doing good marketing and good customer service because the team itself would be rewarded by, you know. Is the, uh, is the yeah, engineer so, mindset more of like a contest or a competition type mindset of doing, a, you know, excelling that way? Are they competitive? Uh, not necessarily. So it depends on the engineer. Some are competitive, some are not. But the thing that everyone pretty much within the engineering field cares about is the reputation among their colleagues. Okay. So they are socially motivated, motivated right. by others around them. They want others around them to think they're cool. So even if they're, they're in like third or fourth place, they just want to be accepted. Yes, they want <laughs> to be accepted and praised by people in their tribe. Okay. Basically. So if you change the tribe's mentality by incentivizing positive um, team engagement, uh, you know, customer service and marketing, that's where you get them into uh, doing those things because they will be motivated and incentivized to do those things. Got it. That will help them feel needed. So meeting their underlying needs. And that's where the social and emotional intelligence comes in. You figure out what are people's underlying needs, what are their desires, and figure out how to restructure your performance management system in that case to meet people's needs and desires. Okay, so before you share with us how to get a hold of you, if someone wants to uh, connect with you and uh, maybe work with you on their, uh, you know, to consult for their company or their business, do you have something else that you want to share with us? Any kind of like uh, new products or something that you're launching or or to specific clients that you're looking for or anything like that? Sure. So I work with leaders in mid-size and large corporations and nonprofits and of all sorts. Kind of that's who I consult for. In terms of products, I'm actually working on an app for wise decision making. And any folks who are interested in that app that combines reason and logic with your emotions and intuitions are welcome to email me at gleb at intentionalinsights.org and just think I'll be happy to share a beta version of that app with you and then you can give me feedback on it and also use it for yourself to help you make good decisions. That sounds so, like a pretty cool app. You just go on your phone, you can make decisions with your phone now? Yes. Should I marry her? It through. <laughs> <laughs> it's yes, pretty cool. it helps you go through that process that I talked about at the <laughs> beginning, kind of you know, evaluating things, putting numbers Very on cool. them and then so the reason and logic step and then evaluating with your gut, with your intuitions and emotions, whether those numbers make sense for you. Okay, well, uh, well that, uh, why don't you, thanks again for taking the time here. Could you sh share again how to get a hold of you specifically, your website? Uh, sure. I, you... My website is glebtsipurski.com. So you can just look for my name, Gleb Tsipurski, and it will be there in the Synergy Cafe uh, information. So glebtsipurski.com and my email is gleb at intentionalinsights.org. Again, it's going to be present on my website. You can get a hold of me. I'll be glad to chat with you and send you the information on the app. So just let me know that you heard me on the Synergy Cafe show and I will send you a free link to the app. Can they also get to, get to you by intentionalinsights.org? Yes. They can okay. get to me by intentionalinsights.org. That's on the consulting uh, company. That's just kind of the content that we produce. So you're welcome. That's a nonprofit that popularizes these strategies. But at least they can get you're a hold of you that way out. rather than trying Absolutely. to spell Sikorsky. <laughs> <laughs> intentionalinsights.org. Okay. Thank you, Gleb, for taking the time. Appreciate it for being on Synergy Cafe. You be well. Thank you very much. You too, Brad. Have a great day.